Hello, everyone. I'm Marianne Meskis, the Executive Director of the Dravet Syndrome Foundation. Thank you for joining us tonight for the start of the 2021 DSF Conference. We're excited to be kicking off our event with a special sibling session, beginning with a sibling survey update, followed by a Q&A with our panel of sibs who will answer questions submitted by our community. With that, I would like to introduce you to our session moderators, Lori Bailey and Dr. Carla Shad of Zogenix. Lori is the Associate Director of Medical Affairs and Patient Advocacy at Zogenix and has been working in the pharmaceutical industry since 2010. She led the development and implementation of a groundbreaking project called the Sibling Voices Survey, which many in our community participated in. It was designed with input from the rare epilepsy communities and healthcare professionals to gain knowledge and understanding on the impact of Dravet syndrome and other rare epilepsies on the siblings within the family. Lori continues to collaborate with DSF and other rare epilepsy communities to better understand and support families on met needs. Carla is the Senior Director of Medical Affairs at Zogenix, functioning as the US field lead for the Medical Science Liaison Team. She attended medical school at the University of Missouri and completed her general pediatrics and child neurology training at the University of Arkansas and Arkansas Children's Hospital. Prior to attending medical school, she also completed a master's research biology program in neuroscience with a focus on the serotonergic system. And with that, I'll hand it over to Lori and Carla. Awesome, thank you so much, Marianne. And thank you to everyone out there in the community for joining us tonight. It is such an incredible privilege and honor to be here with you and have this important conversation. So one of the areas that I wanted to highlight from the findings from the Sibling Voices Survey that I think is really important, and it's one of the reasons why these conversations are so critical, is that we surveyed four different, uh, we had four different surveys where parents participated, siblings participated, younger siblings ages uh, 9 to 11, 11 to 17, and then adult siblings. And what was really interesting is that when we looked at the results, the parent perception of siblings, depressed or anxious mood symptoms were significantly lower than what sibling reports. So this tells us that parents may not be aware sometimes when their siblings may be struggling. And so tonight we're so pleased to be having a conversation and answering parents' questions about what it's like to be a sibling and what it's like to grow up with a brother or a sister with Dravet. And so today I'm really delighted to have obviously my colleague Carla join us, but also important Ryan, Kelly, Murphy, Sophie, and Kate, who are going to be here to share their experiences. I do want to make sure that everyone takes the opportunity to visit the virtual tote bags because there's important information in there as it relates to the survey. There are two infographics for you. For parents, there's a version that provides highlights uh, from the survey, but then also there's a sibling version. So I really encourage you to take that infographic that highlights the findings and sit down with your sibling and share it with them. It shows what siblings reported as far as their challenges and their struggles. And this is a great way to open a conversation with your siblings. Also, if you haven't already, we have two sessions that are uh, going to be happening Friday and Saturday for the younger siblings. So if you haven't already registered, please do so because we're going to have a lot of fun. So with that, I would like to get started and have you, have you meet all of our wonderful siblings. First off, I'm going to toss it over to Kelly. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us uh, tonight. So my name is Kelly Stanley. I am 25 years old and I live in the northern suburbs of Chicago. Um, I'm a cardiology physician assistant. I have four younger or three younger siblings. I'm the oldest of four. Uh, my younger sister, Emily, she's 21. She has Dervais. I also have a younger brother, Tommy, who has Down syndrome, so two special needs um, siblings in the family. Uh, something unique about my relationship with my sister is I share guardianship with my parents of her, um, so we did that when she turned 18, so that's something a little bit unique about um, our relationship. Now I'm going to hand it over to Ryan to introduce himself. Hi, uh, my name is Ryan. I am 28 years old. I am from Boston, Massachusetts. 
Um, I'm a wealth manager at JP Morgan, and I am the older brother of my little brother, Jake, who has Dravet syndrome. And I love him very much. And even though he has Dravet, um, I couldn't ask for a better brother. And I'll pass it now to Kate. Hi, my name is Kate Bulio. I'm 14 and going into high school next year. Uh, I'm the oldest of five siblings. I, my littlest sister, her name is Anna. She is six years old and was diagnosed with Dravet at six months old. Um, it really changed my perspective on just how I talk to my siblings and behave with them. Um, and I'm so happy to be here. So thank you. I'm going to pass it now to Murphy. Hi all, my name is Murphy Penwell. I'm from Madison, Wisconsin, and I am 20 years old. Um, I currently go to Xavier University in Cincinnati, and I am the youngest of three siblings. Uh, I have one sibling, Grace, who's 23, who has Dravet syndrome, and my oldest sibling is Annie, who is 25. And uh, that's about it right now. I'll hand, toss it over to Sophie. Hi, I'm Sophie. Um, I am 27 years old and I currently live in Denver, Colorado. I am one of three kids. I have an older brother who's about a year and a half older than me. And then I have my Gervais sibling, Elliot, who is six years younger than me. Um, so there's quite a bit of an age gap there. Um, that's all I have for now. So Carla, I'm going to pass it off to you. Well, I, I, Sophie, thank you very much. And, and uh, to Laura's point, I just wanted to really give a, a moment of applause for these kids because Lori and I, I've been with Zogenics for five years and Lori and I together have been the Mutt and Jeff show for four and a half years working with these fabulous siblings. And I just want to express how much of a privilege it has been over the last several years. I'm looking at this panel and, you know, seeing some of these kids grow up before our eyes, it's really exciting to see what's going on in their lives. Little Kate, she was, I mean, I met her nearly four years ago and she was this little bitty thing and she's grown into this gorgeous young woman Kelly, her her brother Tommy, I've had so much fun with him in these sibling sessions as well. And and Miss Sophie, how you've grown up, and and to see all of you guys grow up. And and the one thing that I can express about these beautiful siblings is how much they truly love the Dervey effect of sibling, and how much they are involved in their lives. Every one of these kids are representative of how important that sibling connection is to the affected child. So for those in the audience, our caregivers and other family members out there, these kids are so important and they also love you very, very much and are devoted to the family. So kids, thank you. And I'm so proud of you. I just listened to your stories and how much you've grown up and what you're doing. Miss Kelly, you know, being a, a physician assistant, that is so, so inspiring. And, and, and Lori and I have noticed that over time, these kids, as they grow up, they, they find jobs that they are really devoted to others and to support others. So, you know, it doesn't always work out that, but these kids are so unselfish and it is such a privilege to have been here. So enough about that. I just want to get in. The, the most important thing are these kids in front of us, these young adults that we have. And I'm going to open it up with a very simple question. And, and it's very, it's a, it's open and but how has having a Dravet syndrome affected sibling affected your life? And, you know, whenever you have anything, it's, there's positives and negatives with that. So I'm going to turn it to you guys. And, you know, who would like to start first? I can go Kelly, ahead and start. I, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. So I would say having um, a Dravet affected sibling um, affects pretty much every aspect of your um, life, especially as a younger child, um, being dependent on your parents um, when you're young, you know, for rides anywhere you want to go or um, having them supervise 
play dates with your friends, you know, anything like that. Your parents, you know, you need them when you're young, but obviously your Gervais affected sibling needs your parents as well. Um, I think as you get a little bit older, your life um, isn't as affected, but I would say, you know, every single aspect of your childhood is really affected by Gervais, good or bad, um, you know, family outings, planning travel, planning anything, you know, and knowing that anything can change on the drop of a dime. Um, you know, it, it really affects your younger childhood, I, I would say. Ryan, I see you're off mute. Well, do you have something to add to that? Yeah, um, you know, I, I attest to um, what Kelly just said. Um, you know, it, it is a big burden on the family, um, especially the parents starting at a young age. Um, but I can tell you this, it's, it's made me, um, you know, more appreciative of what I have and being healthy and, you know, having a sibling with Gervais um, has made me a much better person, a much more understanding person, a much more patient person. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of bad that comes with it. Um, but it, it truly does test your whole family and it does make your whole family, I think, a lot stronger. And Ryan, to that point, where did you notice the evolution of your mindset of that? Because you're one of the older siblings on that panel today. Where did you start seeing that evolution? Yeah, you know, um, I just think that as you get older, maybe like in high school and college, you realize that a lot of kids have no idea what it's like to have a sibling with Gervais. And I feel like a lot of people take a lot of things for granted that I don't take for granted because I have Jake. Um, you know, I wake up every day healthy. You know, I work a 12 hour day at my job, but I don't complain at all because I know that Jake, you know, can't walk, can't talk, can't eat, doesn't have friends, can't go to school. Um, it's the simple things that, you know, your average person, you know, would completely take for granted. Um, and I think having that mindset every day um, pushes me to be successful, um, give back, and really appreciate the things I have. Murphy, I see that you're off mute now. I, I totally agree with you, Ryan. I feel like having, having grace um, has made me much more, uh, just a better person all around, more compassionate, as you said, patient. Um, like, it, it sucks. It really does suck what, that they have Gervais syndrome. But as a sibling, it kind of, it's, it's a rewarding thing to be able to like cherish what the life I have and I try and make uh, and it's trying to make it be the best life for grace and the best life for everyone else around me and the people who are affected by other things that I don't even know about just being a good person from and learning from my sister has taught me or has shown me that you don't know what's going on with people. You look at me, you don't, you don't see, oh, this person has, this person has a sibling with Dervais syndrome. You see, oh, this is just a 20 year old guy who's in college. But then there's always the, the backstory. And that's something that I've learned that when, you, when I look at someone, you don't, you don't realize like you can, you don't, you don't know the backstory. And I think that's something that has taught me to be more open in life. And it is, it's healthy to talk about, and it's good to open up and talk about stuff like that. Um, so that's what I have to say on that. Miss Kate. Yeah, so I think that we can all agree Gervais syndrome itself is just kind of a negative experience. Uh, the, but there's so much positives that come out of it. You realize that you have amazing support systems and you get to meet people. Um, and there's a lot of empathy for people and that's what we've been talking about. You you can't see what other people are going through, but you're going through something yourself and you're just so much more aware of it. And I think that that's a really good thing to just look at in life. 
Very good. And, and to me, uh, having been with these kids in sessions, the maturity that I've seen, you know, I'm looking at Kate, I think I met her for the first time at nine and words that would come out of her mouth were, I mean, on a level of, you know, a high schooler and the maturity and, and level of thinking. And, and then the other thing that has always, you know, grasped my attention with these kids is the ultimate pride. Miss Lori and I would be doing a session and we'd go come out during a, a DSF event and join the larger community. And they would be grabbing us by our hands to go introduce us to their siblings, to their brothers or sisters that were affected with Gervais, beaming with absolute pride. And so to me that if I, it, it's, you know, I just sort of, you know, just, you know, just, blow up of my pride for these kids. And so before we go into the next question, I was remiss in not mentioning that we have some pre-submitted questions. Lori's also monitoring a live chat session. So please don't forget to be providing for those. But we'll move on to the next question. Ms. Lori, do you have anything to ask right here? I, I did actually, and, and thank you for, for reminding because I did want to encourage everybody. We really want this to be a conversation tonight, so we really love to hear from the audience, and please chime in anytime through the chat window uh, with follow-up questions that you have for these amazing siblings. Um, but I did actually have a follow-up question to the last one that, you know, for any of you, did you always feel that way? Did you Were you always able to have that perspective from when you were very young, or did it take you some time to, to learn and understand? Because I think it's amazing what you all have learned and the people that you have become, but did it start out that way? In, in short, no. Uh, uh, I don't think I really, like, really comprehended it until probably even high school, like 14, so like Kate's age. Um, that at being the youngest, it just was something I grew up with. And I, like, I didn't, I didn't, I don't know how, I don't, didn't, I didn't really understand, like, how much I cared for someone until, like, something bad happened or there was a, someone said something and it made me mad or something like that. And so now it affects me even more. And I care so much more now than I did, like, even five years ago or, uh, 10 years ago, so. I think adding on to what Murphy was just saying, I think it's also important to acknowledge that like order of siblings kind of matters too. Like he's the youngest, I'm middle and my younger brother affected with Gervais is six years younger than me. So I had a normal before him. Um, so I think that just kind of gives a different perspective is because I, I did know what family vacations were like without having a sibling that required all of this extra attention and things like that. Um, so having him come into my life six years later, of course, I was like the loving older sister who absolutely adored this new baby in our life, but it really did change our family dynamics in a huge way. And I think his Gervais has affected my life differently through different stages of my life, but there was definitely times growing up that resent is a harsh word, but just, I res resented the situation, resented the amount of time that he took my parents away from me or that we couldn't do things together as a whole family that I only got to do things with one parent. Um, but it, I, on the flip side, I could also say that he influenced the major decision in my life in the career that I chose entering into special education. And I also work for another rare epilepsy nonprofit part-time. So there's of course positives and negatives, but it wasn't always peachy. And I didn't just become this like great person because of it. It was also really hard as a kid. Well, can I ask you, Sophie, as a follow-up to that and, and also to the rest of the, the folks, was there something that your parents did that to help make coping with the situation better or worse when you were going through those tough times? That's a tough one, I know. So it's hard. Uh, I can go. Unless, Sophie, did you want to go? Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, my parents were very open about They would talk about it with us at the dinner table. And when my sister had a seizure, they would take us to go see her in the hospital. And I got to meet all of her doctors. Um, and just as the oldest sibling, 
I like to be in control and I like to know what's happening. And because they were so open about it, I didn't feel like, you know, I was completely losing my sister and I felt like I could definitely cope with the situation more. Anybody else? Anybody? Well, Miss Lori, I've got this question for these kids is, and it's going to sound sort of funny coming out of my mouth being that they are so young compared to us, but, you know, if you were able to go back in time and, you know, that very short amount of time, and, and as you were younger and coming up, is there any advice that you would give to your younger self that would have maybe helped you out along the way, knowing where you've gone and the roads that you've traveled to this point? Ryan, I see you're off mute. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's hard to tell your younger self that doesn't really know any better advice it, it's i would tell my younger self everything's going to be okay and that it's going to be hard you know and it's, it's there's going to be really hard times you're going to have to constantly sacrifice you know as long as you have a gervais syndrome kid in your family there is always going to be sacrifice every single day um but, you know, I would probably tell my younger self that, you know, there was times where I was embarrassed um, by my brother um, and not embarrassed by him, but almost to the point where I couldn't explain to friends why he was the way he was. Um, you know, I was self-conscious about um, him coming to like events and people not being able to talk to him. Why can't he walk? Why can't he do this? And that was before like high school, that was like in my middle school years. Um, and I wish that I didn't feel that way at that time. Um, but I think the whole thing is a process. And, you know, from those middle school years of me being embarrassed, um, me not knowing how to really cope, I kind of found the strength and I kind of found myself in the process. And I realized that having a sibling with Dravet is not a bad thing. You know, it's nothing to be embarrassed about. Um, you know, he should be loved or the sibling should be loved just the way they are. And it makes me different. It makes my family different and it makes us special in my opinion. But it took years, years and years to get to that point. I didn't get to that point until I was probably 16, 17 years old. Um, so I think I would love to give advice to my younger self, but the only way to kind of find your way through it is just to kind of live through it. That's the only advice I got. That, that was amazing. Miss Sophie, I see that you might have a comment to that as well. Yeah. It's kind of adding off of what Ryan was saying too. I think, if I was to give advice to myself or just give advice to siblings that are kind of going through it right now, it would be that your feelings are valid, no matter if they're positive or negative. Like everything that Ryan was talking about of feeling embarrassed at times or upset that your family dynamics were different or whatever. I just, I think it's really important to feel validated in those feelings. Cause that's something that I had to learn more as a young adult, as a kid, I felt like I had to put on this, um, not a show, but just, I felt like I had to be the big sister who just adored my brother and I wanted to do right by him all the time. And so I didn't want to ever have negative feelings about him or his Dreve or an inconvenience that he caused my family. Um, I just wanted to make it look kind of perfect. And I, I wish that I would have had more of an opportunity to also feel those negative feelings growing up. Sophie, I, I, this is to the panel, and, and obviously we'll, we'll, we'll sort of keep with this question, but has the foundation and, you know, being part of this and, and you know, whenever we're actually in live situations where you guys get to come together at events, does the camaraderie of other affected siblings help you with any of that coping at all? I can kind of start that one off. I feel like I have been lucky enough with my mom 
being um, so involved with the organization to kind of see it as it's grown. And with that, I've seen that all of the sibling support has really grown incredibly over the last five to 10 years. But when I was younger, I had met Kelly actually when we were probably like nine, 10 years old. And that was the first time that I felt like I ever connected with somebody that just got it. And like, we could talk about those things. Um, but outside of that, I think, yes, it makes a huge difference to meet with people that just get it right away. But I don't think that I had as many of those opportunities growing up because these programs just weren't as developed. So for these new families that are coming in, I would say definitely encourage your kid if they can um, to connect with other siblings because I think it is a huge support. Other thoughts to that, kids? I would say too, going off of what um, Sophie was saying, the way that the foundation has programmed the um, sibling events now is a hundred times better than how it was when we were young. I hated going to the sibling events. I dreaded it. I would rather do anything else. I would stay home with Emily and babysit. I didn't care. I was not going. Um, but now helping out at the sibling events um, as an older sibling and seeing how it's constructed now is astronomically better and you guys have done a great job with that and so I definitely encourage families with younger siblings um, to get involved in that because it's a huge community and even though everyone is coming from all over the country you still have those connections that you can always you know keep in touch on Facebook or texting um, and then visit each other at the conferences so I definitely think Kelly you're you're breaking up on us a little bit uh on your on your audio feed gotten so much better and it's extremely helpful for a lot of the, the siblings thank you Kelly I'm sorry, sorry. are you we, able we, to hear me now yeah, we're able to hear you now. Sorry, we, a little bit of that was broken up uh, on your audio feed there. But I, I just have to to say that, you know, we've got a little a chat going on and uh, somebody just wants to tell you the siblings are amazing, first of all, um, and ask a question. I wonder what is their biggest worry that they think about? I can take this Sophie, one first. You want to start anyone else that wants one? to jump in. Yeah. Um, like I kind of mentioned about just like how Gervais has affected me differently throughout my life. I feel like this question probably is different if you ask me at any stage in my life. Um, I think as a kid, it was definitely more of like the seizures in the moment and the safety and all of those things. Um, but I hit this point at some point when I was in college where all of a sudden I had this realization, even though I already knew that it was a possibility, but I had this thought of, there's a chance that Elliot is going to outlive my parents. And what does that look like? And I personally know that I would want to be really involved in that decision. And that is something that stressed me out for probably a good two years. Um, and at this point, I'm, it's not something that stressed me yet, stresses me out on the daily, but I think there's just different worries through different life stages. After I got to a point where that um, was something that I was seriously considering. That was something that I worried about more versus like as a kid, it's the just daily seizure, safety, all that kind of fun stuff. Mm -hmm. My, so I'm about to start my third year of college and never really hit me until when I was a freshman in college, but dang, what if I get a call or I wake up one morning and I hear Grace fell or God forbid something worse happens. That just terrifies me. And especially coming, coming to college, you, I'm a seven hour drive away from home. I, I, it, it's just tough. That's my biggest worry. You know, Murphy, I'm just curious you, cause you're, you said a three hour drive, seven hour drive. So do have you guys, when you uh, started leaving the nest, and Kate, this is going to happen to you here before too long. How was that transition? How did that feel? I was excited. Like, I obviously going to college. Yay, I'm out of the house. Yay, I get to go have fun in college and learn stuff, of course. 
Um, but uh, it, it's it's scary when you think about it when you're far away or not even scary. I'm not like, I'm not scared, but just like worried once in a while. But we FaceTime, me and my other sister talk with Grace all the time. We FaceTime and I FaceTimed her yesterday, I think. Um, she always loves to talk to us. Um, yeah, but that's, I, I, it's, it's what it is, I guess. Kate, soon you're going to be thinking about what happens when you graduate. Have you given it any thought yet? Yeah, I have actually. Um, I used to be like terrified of anything medical. Um, And then obviously when my sister was born, I kind of had to get over that. But now I want to go into the medical field, either being a nurse or a something with like general surgery um and I want to go to a college nearby so that I can be by my sister still very nice I just want to add to that because I feel like just talking to different siblings I've heard basically two spectrums of that decision when it's like time to make a decision of what to do next when you turn 18 some people want to say really close to their family. And then some people want to get like a healthy distance away. And I don't even think I actually thought about it when I was making my decision of where to go to college, but I ended up at a university about five and a half hours away from my family. And I think it was one of the healthiest decisions I could have made for myself because it was that opportunity to step away and reflect on my childhood and reflect on just my perception of everything positive and negative that had happened as a kid, as a result of my brother with Gervais. Um, But yeah, I've heard it both ways. I know people that really want to stay close to their family, but for me personally, it was a really healthy decision to step away. Going going off that, my my decision was to get, go away and kind of get away from everything, get away from my hometown, um, kind of, kind of start a new life, but still have that life to go back on to. Um, The thing that was really important, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> uh, it'll come back. You guys can keep talking. <laughs> you know, Murphy, it, it was interesting when Lori and I were participating in uh, a lot of the sort of the, the discussions with the, the siblings and, and the panel sessions with that. I think one of the most profound things that I ever heard said, and I think I, I say this every time, is one of the siblings, an older sibling actually said, give me my 20s because you will have me for the rest of my life. Does that resonate with you, especially the the ones that have left the nest, knowing that responsibility may be put on your shoulders later? Sophie, you're nodding, yes. (laughs) Yeah, I can speak to that. I have taken that in full stride. Um, Yeah, I, I think kind of how I was talking about earlier, I had those couple years near the end of college where I started to think more about the long-term future and how there was a um, good chance that my brother outlives my parents and then I would become his full-time caregiver, whether that means I'm looking after him in a group home or he's living with me. Um, but I feel like that those couple of years where I was thinking about it a lot made me realize that I really did want to take advantage of this time in my life um, to the point where next year I'm spending a year traveling because I just feel like now is the time to do it. It's hard to know what the future holds, whether that is caring for Elliot or not. I think even just having him as my brother has made me see that I need to take advantage of the moment. Um, And yeah, just exactly like you said, really take advantage of these years that I do have to be a little selfish, honestly, is what it comes down to. And I think I've given myself permission to be a little selfish right now. Ryan, do you have a comment to that as well? Um. Yeah, I mean, so I went to school. Um, I'm from the Boston area. Um, I went to school half an hour away from where my parents live. Uh, my dad travels for work about half the week. Um, one of my biggest worries is, will my mom be able to take care of my brother by herself? Um, so I always want to be home or be around home. Um, you know, I, I grew up in Boston, 
went to school in Boston. I now work in Boston. Um, I also live in Boston because I want to spend as much time with my brother while he's still alive. And I know that sounds hard to say, and that might, you know, it might sound bad, but Gervais syndrome, you know, it's, it's a really tough disease. You know, your sibling might be gone tomorrow. Worry about is again, like his care long-term um, or, you know, if he's 40 years old and he's still seizing all the time, you know, what's his well-being like? Um, what what's my parents' well-being like at that point? Um, those are a couple of things I worry about. Um, because this is a real, you know, Drayson Drayson is no joke. I mean, it's it's really I worry about things like that. Not all the time, but you know, death, quality of life, um, you know, caretaking. There's every single phase of it is a worry. Um, you know, and I think being close to home is where I need to be for those reasons. Thank you, Ryan, uh, for sharing all that. Um, you know, we talked about different phases and different aspects of, of Dravet and the, all the different things that you go through. There's somebody in the chat that says that, uh, they have kids and the youngest uh, child was diagnosed with Dravet. And when the fit, the siblings first saw them have a seizure, they were scared. And so they're asking, you know, what was your reaction the first time you saw your sibling have a seizure? Um, when I first saw my sister have a seizure, she wasn't, she was about five months old and we were at my grandparents' house. And I just remember my mom was like totally freaking out. And she called the ambulance and we went out into the driveway. And she, like, we, I just started crying and crying and I, I didn't know what was happening. Um, and so we went, we went over to my grandparents' neighbor's house and we stayed there for the rest of the day. But it was just, it was something I wasn't used to at all. One second, like we were just having fun being children. And then the next, like my entire life changed. And I think that's scary to think about because that's just not something I was used to or ready for. And it's scary, but it's helpful to know that there were so many people there to like help us all out. Anybody else wanna? Yeah, Sophie. Um, I I feel like I'm 20 years removed probably from the first time my brother had a seizure. So it's been a long time. I don't know that I can speak necessarily to like the first time that I witnessed it. I'm sure that I felt very similar to everything that Kate just described, but I think it's interesting as you get older, how normal that becomes, which is sad, honestly, that it becomes normal and you're not as scared when your sibling is seizing, but it, it does kind of become normal. But I feel like every once in a while I have like, um, a reminder of what it used to feel like when I have someone new in my life, like when my fiance first saw my brother had a seizure, that was a scary moment for him. And I could like remember what it felt like to be there and be like, what just happened? Cause it is terrifying, but unfortunately, as we all know with Gervais, it happens frequently. And so it just does kind of become your norm at some point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sophie, that's for me that having done this with Lori, uh, for me as a, a neurologist, the way that you guys in these sessions, all the way down to the youngsters as young as Kate back when we first started, 
how the kids would describe these seizures so perfectly. I mean, they, I would tell Lori this, that they would describe seizure semiology better than some first year neurology residents and the sense of calmness that they would have and, you know, that they had jobs in the home whenever, you know, it was a bad day, that it was somebody's job to get the, the rescue medications or the, the oxygen or, you know, be the one to have to wait by the door for the, the paramedics. And the simple maturity and calmness about that. And anyone wanted to, you know, I always like to talk about the evolution. What, you know, was there things in your life that helped to, to garner that calmness? Or, or was it just something that you just had to, for lack of a better word, get used to and recognize that you had to play a role? I'll go. Um, I think that, um, you know, Treve, you get used to it. And, you know, like I, for example, I'm 28 years old. I have seen thousands of seizures. Um, and I think as you get a little older, like seven, eight, nine, you for better or worse kind of have to become a parent. And that's a big responsibility, but there's not one thing that like my parents had me do, you know, you just need to naturally kind of kick in and help any way you can. Um, whether that be sitting by your brother, waiting the seizure out, getting the oxygen, calling 911. I mean, at this point we called 911 for the first year. We haven't called 911 for a seizure in my family in like 20 years because we've seen so many of them, right. there's nothing you can really do. So I just think that there's not one job or task that's assigned to anyone. I just think that these seizures just really force you to grow up fast and you become an adult very quickly. Um, I could handle a seizure at the age of 10 better than most nurses could handle seizures Absolutely. in a hospital. Um, I think that's just the reality of the situation. And, um, you know, I just think that, and it does feel good to help for sure. It feels, it feels good to help and contribute to, you know, calming your brother down and being there for him. I know that every time my brother comes out of a seizure, he seems a bit scared and he just wants someone to hold him. And I'm happy to do that. Just like my mom or dad would be too. Now, Ryan, would, let me ask oh, you, sorry. oh, sorry. Go ahead, Kate. Well, I was just going to say pretty much the same thing as Ryan. Um, I'm only 14, but I I could probably be a doctor without the med school. Like, I think that we all can. And um, I also have five siblings, so it's hard to see the youngest. Um, Leo is his name, who didn't understand seizures because he's only four, but, you know, he, she's seized in front of him and now he'll talk about it openly and he will just, he's in the stage where it doesn't exactly scare him unless she's actively seizing, but he's already, it's already so normalized to him that at the age of four, he is okay with it. Miss Kate, so, you were definitely one of those kids that I talk about that mm. definitely knew the the medicine. You, I, there was times I turned to Lori and going, "Oh my goodness, did you hear the words <laughs> of that little girl's mouth?" Well, I remember you talking about the postictal stage, and I thought, "How old are you?" <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's amazing. You're all amazing. But let me ask you this: I know it's something you get used to, but if you are a parent with a young child who's who's seeing this for the first time how do how would you what kind of advice would you give to parents who have to explain this to the sibling what could you you know what advice could you give them to help them explain it to them what like what what would you say
I know that's a tough one. Clearly, that's a really hard I know, question. It, it is Laurie. a tough one. I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad that I wasn't the parent and had to come up with something to say because that is really hard. I think what's especially hard is when you put it into perspective, it's not just that you have to explain it to the siblings, but you're also figuring it out yourself. Like now, if I ask my mom to explain a seizure to me, she could do it in a thousand different ways. But that's also probably the first time or one of the first times that a parent is seeing what's happening is trying to grasp everything that's happening. And then they have to put it in terms that a kid would understand. So I don't have a great answer for you. I empathize with the parents that had to navigate those conversations. I don't remember like explicitly having that conversation with my parents. I think especially the first few times it was such an emergency situation. Like when they're little, it's really like they're going to the hospital and you just think like, my brother's going to the hospital. You're not even thinking about why they're going to the hospital. You're just thinking, I really hope they're okay. Um, yeah, I guess uh, trying to explain it in as simple as terms as possible for like the age appropriate level. So that I think, I guess it's important to point out that if you don't say anything, they're going to make it worse than it is. That being said, I don't know what to say, but don't say nothing. Give them something to work off. Otherwise, you make up a story in your head that's going to be probably worse. Yeah. And now, of course, when you were growing up, Sophie, you couldn't go on the internet, right? You couldn't Google I it. mean, with, with dial-up, probably, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I actually have a story about that kind of, but with my mom being so involved with the foundation, I remember the first time that I like sought out information on my own and there was a bunch of like brochures and pamphlets about Gervais in one of our back cabinets and I found it and that's how I was finding information. Um, and I would not recommend that <laughs> because I was reading things about like mortality rates and just these things that would have definitely been better received if it was a conversation with parents and I was probably at an age that my parents probably should not have brought up mortality rates with me, but I just stumbled upon it. And I think it's just important to acknowledge that now kids do have the internet, so they could easily Google something before you give them that answer or that knowledge that they're seeking. So I think it's better to just give them age appropriate knowledge as appropriate as you can. I'll say something too. Um, you know, I think growing up, my mom, um, she, sort of made the seizures seem normal, not like normal, but she kind of normalized them in some sh way, shape or form. And what she would do is like, she would stay very calm when my brother has a seizure. And I think that's where it starts. I think the parents staying calm during the seizure and taking control trickles down to the sibling. Um, and my mom would sort of normalize it and she would educate me on what was happening and why. Um, and I think, you know, you can make a seizure a terrible situation by just totally freaking out, calling 911, running, getting the oxygen, crying. I mean, you can do that whole song and dance, or you can just realize that the kid's having a seizure. It's probably going to be done, you know, in a minute or two, generally speaking. You know, I've, I've seen seizures go on for five, 10 minutes. But generally speaking, they're going to be over in less than a minute or two. And I know it sounds kind of crazy the way I'm talking about this, but it just it's just a matter of just staying calm, educating yourself, and sort of normalizing yourself to seizures on a daily basis. I mean, again, this is Gervais syndrome. This isn't one seizure a year, two seizures a year. This is seizures every day. I mean, my brother's had dozens of seizures in one day. So it's it's... You know, I think you just need to understand kind of what you're in for moving forward. And again, you become more adjusted over time, but I think it's just important to stay calm, take charge as a parent, trickles down to the sibling and educate as well. You know, on top of that, you know, knowing that this is, always part of your day to that extent. Was there times that you ever really felt lonely or isolated or disconnected from the family because of Dervais syndrome? Yeah. 
any takers on that one? I I want to say yeah, but I can't even think of a reason why because my family is very close, uh, and I'm lucky with how loving we are towards each other. But sometimes I feel like you can't help it, and even if you're given a good situation, there, it's just like this one little thing, and it just makes you. It has this ripple effect. It makes you think all these things or feel all these things, but you don't know why, and it's very confusing. Ms. Kate, in, in those moments, let me ask you this: If you know your family is, you know, uh, focused on the affected sibling, has there been a resource or someone in your life that you could turn to, other than your your immediate parents? another sibling, uh, a teacher, a neighbor? Has there been somebody in your life that's also given you support? Yeah, I think there's been a lot of different people. Um, At one point, I would talk to my brother about it every day. And uh, at another, I was going to a therapist. And you don't need to have like one specific person your whole life when your parents can't be there. because there's been best friends that I've had that, you know, I talk to it about them, talk to them about it. And then, um, and now we don't talk anymore, but I definitely say siblings are a great place to start. I agree with that. Um, when I was younger, I didn't, uh, I didn't really talk to anyone. This I didn't even start really talking to, about it with anyone until probably high school, just because that's how, how I am. I think through stuff a lot on my, my own. However, my sister and I, my oldest sister, who uh, named Annie, um, doesn't, me and Annie have become closer because we've talked about this. We've talked about just like the mental health of everything. Um, and so I think, as Kate said, siblings are the key, there are a key person to talk to. You know, I want to ask a follow-up question to that because, Kate, you mentioned that you um, went to see a therapist. And actually, that's just one of the questions that the parents uh, had submitted. You know, the question is, you know, should I encourage my child to see a therapist or a counselor, even if they're resistant? And if you went, did you find it helpful? Are you, does anyone want to yeah. share share that experience? Yep. Thanks, Kate. Well, it's been really hard for me to at least just talk about therapy because uh, it's not, it's not something that people like to discuss. Um, and it was my idea because I was thinking about Gervais syndrome all the time with my sister during the pandemic. And I kept thinking like, Oh, if, if I get COVID um, what's going to happen to her. And Therapy, I think for everybody, it's it's a different journey for everyone. And you can't force your kid to go, but you also shouldn't stop them if they think it's going to help. And also finding the therapist that works for you that you feel comfortable with is also helpful because I've had multiple different ones. And if you just don't click with them, you don't need to stay. Thank you, Kate. I'm just curious, did anybody uh, talk to like a school counselor? Did that ever come into play? I don't know if anybody else did, but I did. Yeah. Um, (laughs) In fifth grade, I did it partially to skip a little bit of math class. (laughs) But (laughs) if I'm being fully honest, (laughs) I know, sorry. (laughs) Um, But my teacher suggested it. Uh, because I had been going, my sister was in the hospital for a week and he suggested that maybe I could go and talk to someone. Um, that wasn't a great experience for me, but I ended up going back to it a little bit later. So, yeah. I'll add on to that. Um, I think that, um, having a therapist is really important. I personally have a therapist 
um, that I've seen, you know, a handful of times that I like and can rely on. Um, having a therapist is a privilege. First of all, I, I want to make that very clear. It's a privilege to have a therapist. It's not something to be embarrassed about. Everyone in the world should have a therapist. Anyone can benefit from having a therapist. So it's something to be embarrassed about or worry about. It's that, that should be a normalized thing. Um, but personally, I've gone to a therapist for different reasons besides my brother. Um, and, you know, I've done that kind of on my own and I've benefited from that. I'll say that, you know, I don't think it's out of the question that someone that has a sibling with Gervais syndrome could benefit from seeing a therapist. But I'll also say this, that therapist doesn't know a single thing about Dravet syndrome. That therapist doesn't know a single thing about what it's like to live with a sibling with Dravet syndrome. So forcing your kid to see a therapist, I think, is the complete wrong move. The only people that I can talk to about my brother are my parents and maybe like my cousins and my extended family because they know him. It's really hard to talk and unload your feelings to someone about a Gervais sibling to someone that's never lived it. Um, so I'll, and again, this is all to say, see a therapist. It's great. I encourage it, but just to, just to send your kid to a therapist to talk about their Gervais experience with someone who has no idea what it's like, isn't always going to be helpful. So that's my experience. Um, but I definitely would encourage, you know, everyone to have a therapist, including the parents. I think the parents should have therapists. If you're not seeing a therapist, I mean, being a, being a parent with a Gervais child, can drive you crazy, crazy. It's the, it's one of the hardest jobs in the world. I don't know how my mother, my mother manages, manages, manages my brother's care. I don't know how she does it. I don't know how she does it. Um, so I think it's important for the, the parents and the kids to have therapists for whatever reasons they want to go to a therapist for. Mm-hmm. Ryan, let me ask you this question because, you know, Kate's living it now, but you all have lived through your adolescence and teenage years where sometimes you get a little bit, you know, more selfish and more, you know, it's about me and, you know, it's all, you know, it's what's going on and in, in surrounding. Did you ever have a situation where, you know, you just didn't feel like that you were getting the attention that you needed. And then when you sat down, it's like, that was stupid. You know, it's like, and get, have that guilt about feeling like you were having a bad day, just hoping that you had somebody else worry about you because you're being that adolescent that everything's about you. Any, any takers on that one? Kate, you're living it right now or. Is it, is, is it unique being a teenager w- w- as a sibling that, you know, sometimes you're trying to get your independence? Well, I think as just because of having a Juve sibling, I'm a lot more independent than maybe I would be without her. But um, yeah, I definitely have had moments, even as a, like, a younger kid, um, where I just wanted all eyes on me. And it's hard to come to the realization, and I'm trying to get there, that um, I'm, my parents don't have favorites. They just have priorities. And uh, they're going to do what's best for our family. And it's going to be difficult to see that all play out. But, yeah, I guess it's it's not super drastically different in my opinion. Carla, are you able to hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, Sorry about that. I've been having some connection issues, but um, I can chime in on this question. Something that um, I distinctly remember um, in high school mostly was sporting events um, and really not, I guess, understanding why both parents couldn't be at every everything and every um, event and competition. But, you know, you have that little like selfish part of you that wants your parents there, wants even your siblings there. And, um, you know, it's just not not possible um, always. Sometimes maybe, but 
most of the time not. And so even understanding why you still have that that feeling that you want them there and you don't want to explain it all later. You know, you don't want to explain your game or your, you know, whatever later to your, to your dad that couldn't go or um, to your siblings that weren't there. So I think, you know, and as Sophie said earlier, just having those feelings and knowing that it's not invalid, even though you understand that it's not possible, you can still feel upset about that kind of thing. Um, But that's something I remember, you know, throughout high school, always being like, why is my mom the only one here? You know, why is my dad the only one here? So. Ellie, I was just having this conversation with my mom earlier because we were talking about some of these questions that had come up. And I was saying that I, there's just no right way to live a family life with Gervais. Like there's just not a perfect way to do it. And I think my parents probably thought that they were giving me an outlet where I felt really special when I was really involved with travel soccer. And it was kind of my dad and I's thing. And he would go to all my tournaments and um, we would travel out of state for and all these things. But even though they felt like they were giving me that outlet where I got to feel really special and important, I would look around at those tournaments and see all of these families that got to do it together as a unit. And I still felt that like sense of sadness or like, I wish my mom could be here too, or I wish my brothers could be here as well. And I knew that wasn't a realistic option and they thought they were doing this thing to make me feel really special, but there's, there's just no great way to, to make everyone happy, unfortunately, with a child with Gervais in the family. Sophie, did you have the comfort though, that, um, you know, having a bad day type situation, you know, with, let's just call it a normal day, but you don't, you don't want to be, you know, an additional problem to mom and dad, but did you have comfort going to them and, and not have guilt to say, Hey, you know, I'm having this problem. I need to talk to you about it. Could you do that comfortably? Talk to my parents about it. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah. Just in general, if you were having a bad day, did you feel as though that you're adding more to their their worries and their stress? Or did you have that comfort to say, hey, you know, I just broke up with my boyfriend. This really sucks. Honestly, I, to no fault of my parents, I think I just internalized a lot of it of being as little of a burden as possible to yeah. them. So I definitely always tried to be like, the perfect child and always get straight A's and do everything right and help out by cleaning the kitchen or whatever. And I think it was kind of a combination of I'm seeking a little bit of attention, but I'm also just like trying not to burden them because I know that their lives are already so challenging. We have a question since we're talking about all this and coping with these different types of emotions, one of the, one of the folks uh, out there is asking what has helped you guys cope. Is there something that really uh, that you can think of as you were going through this, that really was helpful during those times when you were having those emotions to help you cope? I can take this one real quick. Um, I, also play soccer and it's it's like my thing and my family's thing um and every once in a while we just go and play soccer as a family and i uh i actually have tryouts after this um and it's just like always this one thing that i can turn to there's always someone to go play soccer with or i can go out to our backyard and just do what I want to do. Um, and it's really nice to have a creative outlet or a hobby as something that a child can just depend on for themselves and they don't need like anybody else in their family to help them out with it. Sorry, I'm just reading the chat here. There's uh, somebody says there's also a situation where the Dravet child is left behind with other care providers. Any thoughts on pros or cons of that? Did you guys experience that, the other side of that? So my family has, how many, like three people that, three care providers, or I don't want to call them friends because that's really what they are, to grace. Um, and they're, they're awesome. Like we left 
them. They have taken care of grace countless times. They understand the thing. And I, I think it's, I encourage it. It's something that it's good for the, especially the parents or, and sit, uh, other kids to kind of get away from the situation, get away from that environment. And like, I want to say enjoy life, but that's not what I mean. Like enjoy the time away, like with, like, with, for example, it's enjoy my time with my parents, for example, just the, like the three of us. That That's something that is, inc- uh, that I think is, I, I would encourage and it's healthy. Nice. Yeah. And Murphy, I would say it's a healthy balance of both. So there, there was definitely times where like we would go to a family event and I would be sad if my brother was at home with the caregiver because I want him to be there because I really enjoy him and I want other people to really enjoy him as well and kind of show him off, I guess. That sounds bad. But I wanted other people to get to experience him and for him to get to have those experiences. But then I also loved if there was a provider that could take care of him and we trusted that we could have that like exclusive time where Gervais wasn't kind of the center of attention. So I think it's kind of a healthy combo if you can do that. And I will also say that is a privilege, just like Ryan was saying, therapy is a privilege. Not everyone can find providers in their area, reliable ones or ones that they can trust. Um, But if you can take advantage. There's another question in here. This is an interesting, this is a little bit of a different topic. My daughter used to want to fight whenever someone had something bad to say about her sister. Sorry, I have to move this around. Have you experienced people being mean to your sibling or talked bad about them? Uh, I've never had the uh, time where people, someone's like talked bad about them, but it's more like not understanding the situation. Like they, my, you can clearly tell that there's something, like my sister has a disability, um, but then there's people who just don't care about that. And they're like, why is she walking so slow? Why, like, why is she not understanding the directions? I'm like, you, you have, there's just, that's what's the frustrating part. There's people who like can't get through their head that there's something wrong with something, a disability that's wrong with this person. That's when I get frustrated never like physically want to i have said stuff to people where i'm like yo come on you can clearly see that there's like come on she has a disability let it let it be sorry like but not like physical ever Mm -hmm. has has that ever affected your own personal friendships and going through high school and into college because of the disability um, it's never been with people that I've known. Everyone that I'm friends with and know are usually pretty good and understanding about that. Um, it's all it's just random people like on the street, at a store, yeah. at an amusement park, stuff like that. That's where it, when I run into situations. Mm-hmm. I think it's healthy to want to stand up for your sibling too, just like you would whether they had a disability or not. Of course, it's just doing that in a way that's not physically fighting somebody. Um, but yeah, I think having the conversation and like that is a healthy response that like somebody you're you love this person and you feel hurt by the things that people are saying or acting toward them. But let's talk about how we can like go about that in a better way. Um, I thankfully didn't have a lot of those experiences growing up. I think the age gap made a difference. We're six years apart, and my brother went to like a therapeutic day school. And so a lot of the people that I was friends with or my peers didn't know him unless I invited them into my home. Right. And kind of like Murphy was saying, if they're your friends. They're not going to be your friends if they're not going to accept your sibling right. at the end of the day. And so I didn't have that many experiences with that growing up. I want to add oh. to it too. Oh, yeah. um, I would just say that, you know, anyone that's, making fun of us with someone with a disability is purely a reflection of that person. Um, They'll look back at themselves in 10 years and hate themselves for doing that. Um, And I would just say on the flip side of that, you know, when I've had friends that have come up to my brother and acknowledged him and said something to him, even though he can't respond, 
that means a lot to me. And that's also a reflection of that person. Um, so I would just say that, you know, anyone that makes an effort to, um, you know, be kind to your Gervais sibling or say hi to them or shake their hand or, you know, laugh and just kind of hang with them. I would keep those people around and close to you. And anyone that doesn't make an effort to acknowledge that Gervais said, you know, sibling or God forbid, make fun of you, cut those people out of their, out of your life. Um, because they're probably going through other things in their home, you know, in their lives that they're not happy with. Um, cause there's no reason to say anything bad about anyone with a disability. Um, and it's purely a reflection of those people. Um, and that's just an absolute disgrace. And I'm sorry for whoever's daughter had to go through that. Cause that's just a pure disgrace. <laughs> You know, Ryan, that it was interesting when Lori and I would be doing these sessions over the last several years, it always seemed like that for most of the kids, they had one or two besties that would always be coming over to their houses that were almost like an extended sibling and, um, you know, equally protective, you know, also, you know, equally being brothers and sisters because you're still able to do normal things with your brothers and sisters and to hear how that interaction was. And I, to me, I thought that was... Uh, often a very good coping skill um, for to have that close relationship with that bestie. But with that, was there other things that, you know, that you guys did whenever, you know, because, you know, it just with any child with a disability, you know, some behaviors, some of the eating dis um, behaviors, even the, the sleep hygiene for these kids is quite unique. Was there things that you guys did in addition to having that close bestie that helped you guys sort of cope. I know with Kate's group that, you know, believe it or not, drawing and art was always a good outlet. Music was a good outlet. Were there other things that you guys have used over the years to, to sort of, you know, bring you back to that inner peace type of thing? This is a very practical <laughs> suggestion, um, but we as a family had keypad locks to get out of our house because my brother um, was like at risk for elopement. He would just walk off and not realize that that was unsafe. And so we had to enter a code to get out of our house. And at some point in our childhood, my parents added those to our bedroom doors so that he could not come in without our permission. And I just think that that like the laughable at this point in my life was such a healthy thing for us to have because it was a space that was our own and when he my brother was and still can be aggressive and when he got to those um, moments I had the opportunity to walk away and go to kind of like my safe space and decompress um, and he couldn't come in <laughs> so yeah I, we actually heard more than one person described that quote unquote safe zone that they would be able to go to isolation and for whatever reason, either to protect themselves or just to, I just need a moment. And, uh, and that was, that was something that we heard very commonly. Others to that. Same thing. My room was my, my area. My sister could get in there, however, but, uh, it still is my area. Cool. Very cool. Uh, this is really simple, but just going on walks, whether by yourself or with like a friend, it's just a really nice way to clear your head. I'll add to that too. I just think that you have to take every day, just one day at a time. Um, you know, I, I played a bunch of sports growing up as a kid. So that was a good outlet for me. Went to the gym. That was a good outlet for me. Um, but sometimes I wanted to be with my brother. Sometimes helping to cope with it is spending time with my brother. Sometimes that would make me feel better. Um, so I think whether you're alone with your family, with your friends, going on a vacation, playing sports, drawing, doing a hobby, I think it, for me, it changed every day. Um, and it really just depends on your mood, how you're feeling, how your family's feeling, how your brother's or sister's doing. Um, it, I think it's constantly changing. I don't think there's one thing that's right or wrong. One of the folks um, in the chat is asking you guys, if you're looking back, what are some of the things that your parents did to make things better for you or the family? 
Um, it just go with the day as best you can. That's what my parents did. We'd go on a vacation, and if my sister had a seizure, she had, she had a seizure, and we'd adapt and move on. Like it's it's something that as a family we learned how to create distractions for ourselves. My sis, my sisters, or my sister, can we ski with her? She we do adaptive skiing. She if she has a seizure, for example, from that then. We handle that there. And the whole point is just you got to adapt and move on. And that's, I, I praise my parents. They did a great job with that. Um, yeah. That's awesome to hear, Murphy. Any going other? Off, yeah. Kelly. Going off of that, um, you know, growing up, we always did, you know, different outings or different, um, even just going swimming at the lake or, going to great America, you know, different things. And just like Murphy said, you know, you take it as it is and you, you do what you can with your plans and just knowing that the plans might change. Um, but our, our, my parents definitely did a lot, um, for us, you know, planning different things when we were younger and especially, you know, getting us involved in sports and, um, clubs at school, meeting other people just to have, you know, another, outlet um for times of stress or trying to you know cope with situations you had outlets um through different things so just getting involved in a lot of different things and then also planning as much as you can with your with your DeRay sibling and also without you know different outings with just your mom or just your dad or um it that time I think to let you have a childhood outside of Dravet even if your day does change um I think that is really important and something that a lot of parents, I think, definitely try to do. Um, I just have a small thing to add on. My parents are very, uh, they find it very important to just say something simple to me every day. Like when I wake up in the morning, it's like, good morning, beautiful. I love you. Like, hope you have a good day. And it's at first, I'd always be like, oh, shut up. Like, dad, that's that's silly. <laughs> and he, but he just always kept doing it. And after school, he'd always give me a hug. And uh, it's just like the simple reminders of um, I love you and you're special to me and you're important. And I hope you have a good day. That, I think, is really helpful. Yeah, and to add with, to what Kate said, too, um, really important to tell your kids that you love them. Um, it's just, you know, provide unconditional love. And I would also say too, I think, um, you have to treat these kids like adults and you have to respect your kids because they basically have to live the life of an adult in this situation. Um, so I think they, they should command that respect. And I think, you know, I think the siblings and the kids know more and understand more than maybe the parents think. So I think having that respect for the, for the kid as an adult, pretty much, you know, they might not be an adult in all ways and all facets, but I've been an adult in my eyes since I was eight to 10 years old, you know, and in, in so many different ways. So I think, and I think my parents always kind of saw that in me. Um, and I appreciated the respect that they showed for me. Um, so, you know, Love and respect. Ryan, let me ask you this question because uh, you hit the nail on the head because the maturity level with you guys is just off the charts. And and whenever you achieve that, to flip it, did you guys, in addition to worrying about your, your brother, affected brother or sister, how often do you guys worry about your parents and the stresses that are happening with them and then trickling down, you know, you know, the marriage that, you know, the household finances, was that something that was a common concern that as you're not only worrying about your brother or sister, you're also worrying about mom and dad. Yeah. I would say I worry about my mom and dad just as much as I worry about my brother. Uh, that. Short and simple. I've started to worry more about my parents just because now that I'm out of the house, it's just the three of them there. My mom, my dad, and my, my sister who has Gervais. Uh, just like getting being tired of and just mentally just exhausted from taking care of my sister in that case. Yeah, I feel like 
I worried about them more when I left the house because when you're there, you feel some sense of control, even though obviously I didn't have any control over what happened with my parents or my family, but you at least feel like you have some sense of control when you're there and you can feel like you're helping with your sibling or whatever. Right. And I definitely felt, um, I guess, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I just felt guilty when I left in some ways because I knew then they were having to do it all on their own. And obviously most of their lives they've done it all on their own and they're perfectly capable, but I wasn't there to provide that extra support to watch them so that they could go out to dinner to like do any of those things. And, and, and Sophie, I was actually, whenever, you know, we we're talking earlier, guilt was a word that kept coming to mind. It's like, as you guys are transitioning into your, your later years and that you see that your affected sibling, you know, pretty much is not going to. And, uh, and then also, you know, at least for right now that you're able to have some semblance of, you know, normalcy for, for what it is. Is there a significant more amount of guilt now than there was when you were younger? I would say so. Like I said earlier, I even described it as selfish. I feel like I am choosing to be selfish for my own mental health at the moment in my young and mid twenties. Um, but there's definitely moments where I feel guilty. I think especially like after going and spending a week with my family for the holidays or something. And I just am reminded of how challenging my brother can be and how much work he requires. And he's 21. And at this point, my parents should be empty nesters. And it's just that reminder that they're never going to be empty nesters. Um, yeah, definitely more guilt now than when I was a kid. I agree with you. Uh, as a kid, you don't really understand the concept of feeling guilty for your parents because your parents are always there. They're, they're role models. They pay for everything. They support you. So you don't think of the guilt part towards your parents, but as, you, as I've aged, um, you realize... I feel the only part I really feel guilty about is like how much they've sacrificed for me and especially my sister and my other sister. Um, just like try and give us the best life we can, which they could. Murphy, you just gave me goosebumps because I mean, it's always, you know, you guys are so unselfish in the, the bigger thing of this, that you're always recognizing how much is there for you or it's to me that I've never seen a, a, a less selfish group of people than the Dervais siblings. Mm -hmm. um, but you still think as though that you are and, and rightfully everybody is selfish at some point, but you guys are truly amazing in that how so selfless that you are with these things. Yeah. Now I want to ask you, you all, believe it or not, there are a lot of parents out there who themselves feel guilty for the life that they've given you. So what do you say to those parents? What do you? I can go first. Yeah. Um, I think just hang on to the idea that your kids, the siblings in particular are going to struggle when they're kids and they're going to have to, learn how to navigate some of their feelings on their own but eventually there's like light at the end of the tunnel I feel like as you get older and more mature you really can um, dive into your feelings about things and you see the big picture more like you I appreciate my parents so much more as an adult and everything that they did for us growing up than I ever did as a kid because you just they're just not there and developmentally they can't appreciate the full picture so just keep doing your best and know that one one day you will get the acknowledgement that you deserve for doing your best and your kids love you. I I agree with that. Um, I know it gets me right here. <laughs> Sorry, Murphy. No, no, I, agree. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to say I agree with exactly what you said. This is why we are so impressed with you guys. You're so amazing. Just that selfless love. I mean, we see it not just with your sibling with Gervais, but for your siblings without Gervais, for your parents, for other people that you meet. And it's, it's, it's really amazing. And it's, I know in working with you all, you certainly have also taught me a lot. Yeah. So very appreciative of you. 
yeah, you always in in my day with goosebumps or uh, at least a couple of tears in my eye. But as we're, we're I think we're approaching the end of time, Lori. But uh, mm-hmm. well, for the session, not the end of time. Sorry, guys. Um, is that um, you know I've I've known most of you for a very long time, but I have also seen a few kids out there that seem to be struggling a little bit more than you know the kids that we've seen Lori and I ran into a couple of kids and even parents have came up to us and asked um, very specific questions what would you recommend if a, a parent was really you know because I'm quite sure you've had those bad bad days that whenever they are really struggling the most what can a parent do to help them in that moment so I'm obviously on the younger end of the people here, but I think that uh, especially, I'm, I'm so thankful for uh, my parents because when I'm having a really hard day and I just don't want to get out of bed, sometimes all of the things that are so normal to, norm- to other kids, like going to school or doing a presentation or just like getting ready in the morning, that can be so much harder when you've got the weight of the world on your shoulders. So um, my mom would let me every once in a while, just like take a day off and spend some time with her, just me, just me and her. Uh, we would go to a coffee shop and she'd be like, do you want to talk? And so we'd talk or just, you know, do things like that. And I think that's really important to have a very close bond with your kids and just to know that you're not going to have a normal life, but sometimes it's okay to pretend like you do. Very profound. Well, before we wrap things up, there's a couple things. First of all, I want to just say thank you, a huge thank you to these amazing siblings. You guys, you have no idea how much respect and love that we have for you. Um, We're just so grateful that you took your time to come here and share your very personal thoughts and perspectives with everybody who's here. Um, It's very, very helpful for them. Uh, And I also, I do want to remind folks that we, after we completed the search, uh, the research, we worked with and collaborated with the Dravet Foundation to come up with some amazing resources for all of you. So you can stop by the exhibit booth to learn more. You can go directly to dsfsupersibs.org. There are resources for parents to support parents how to recognize signs when your sibling is struggling and other helpful information. There are special VIP sibling kits for siblings, two different age groups. So if you haven't already gotten those, please, please do um, stop by the booth or go to the website and make sure you're registered for the family network and all the resources are completely free. So please do reach out um, because there are there for you. So with that, I'm going to throw it now back to Mary Ann to close us out for the night. But thank you again, everybody. Really appreciate all of you. And it's been such a pleasure and an honor to be here. So thank you. That was really such a powerful session. Thank you, Lori and Carla. And really a special thanks to our amazing SID panel. You're so open and honest in sharing your experiences. And I know that our, our parent community really appreciate that. So thank you, Kelly and Kate and Sophie and Ryan and Murphy. Um, a few notes for day two of our conference. We hope you'll join us back here tomorrow at 12 Eastern time. And that's when we'll click up or kick off our clinical sessions, which will give overviews um, on diagnosis and clinical presentation of Dravet syndrome, as well as new treatments. And then from 5.30 to 6.30, we invite you to stop by for some 20 minute presentations and Q and A's with three of our industry partners, Encoded Therapeutics, Longboard Pharmaceuticals and Greenwich Biosciences. Um, In these sessions, excuse me, you can hear a little bit about new treatments and some of the special projects that each of them are working on. And then, of course, we hope that you'll log back into the portal for our Drave discussion lounges from 7 to 9 Eastern time. These will be moderated by our board and staff members. We hope you'll stop by and take the opportunity to meet them, as well as to catch up with other Drave parents. To access those lounges, you'll just click on the lounge link on the homepage, and then you can select which one of three lounges you want to join. 
And we're also encouraging everybody to stop by with a purple cocktail or mocktail for our virtual happy hour. And on that lounge page, you can find a link at the bottom with some fun suggestions for purple drinks from our board president, Kate Pence. So we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thanks for joining us. Thank you all. You guys are my heroes. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.